Hello, it is day eight of the COVID crisis. Stay at home. What's your middingers? I actually just got word about an hour ago that Lehigh County is now in a shelter in place. So you guys should do that. Um, not to make light of the situation. It's obviously serious. And I hope that everyone's doing well. I hope that everyone's taking care of themselves and life is good. Uh, I'm on my back porch right now because in the house, that's my house, I've got my children and my two nephews that are basically driving me to commit felons. So Beagle and I, this is the Beagle, say hi Mimi. Uh, Beagle and I are hanging out on the back porch and I'm going to do a little video with you guys today about chapter 14, section 4 called The Rise of Populism. Um, basically, uh, when we left off before we left for this COVID crisis stuff, we were talking about the conversation surrounding farmers and homesteaders of the Great Plains. And honestly, farmers had it kind of rough. I mean, the Homestead Act was designed to create that incentive, to create that pull factor, sit down, to create that pull factor, to move those who might be interested in a very cheap plot of land, 160 acres, about 160 football fields, to go and move. But keep in mind, guys, you're not getting rich off of 160 acres. Of land, at least at that time. If you remember, these fields were also not arable fields ready for farming. This is 100% virgin, never touched before acres of land that you're going to have to cultivate. You're going to have to bust the sod and plow and get ready to create some kind of farming. And you had yourself to do it. These people spent their life savings on this cheap land or moving themselves from the East Coast and the South into the Midwest. So this wasn't something that you were really going to be able to invest a whole lot more money into. Most of these farmers who took advantage of the Homestead Act, then had to go into debt, get loans from banks and other industries in order to start to actually create their farm. There was also hugely limited supplies. There was not a lot of wood, so the people were making these sod houses and dugouts and just dirty, dirty, small places. Um, there was very expensive to get livestock and things of that sort, to get seed and, and like we said, bust sod, and there was a lot lot of dry weather. There wasn't as much rain in the Midwest as there was in the East Coast. So some of the challenges that were being faced by these farmers were just astronomical. And that takes us to section four. So if you're watching this video attached to the Google Classroom post with this video is this handy dandy handout called chapter 14, section four populism. You should get this out, whether you make a copy of it for yourself or just have this open as you're watching this video and kind of go along with me. Basically what we're we're talking about here is that farmers started to say enough already. These farmers were struggling so much, not just with the idea of nature and not just the idea of all of the other kinds of hardships that these farmers were facing, but they also started to really struggle and, and fight against the United States economy. Let me explain. I'm back. I'm down here. If you take a look at this, if we would be in class right now, we would be doing an activity where I would pull one of you poor souls up to the front of the room and put a farming hat on you and pretend that you're a farmer. And here was the big challenge. All of these farmers were selling their crops, hopefully at the end of the year, trying to make a profit. At the end of the year, just like any American family today, you're trying to make more money that you make an income than you're spending in your expenditures. So here's a list. If you take a look at this PowerPoint here, here's a list of some of the expenditures of an annual year for a farmer. You've got your supplies from the farm for the farm, your feed mill, your tractors, and things of that sort. You've got to feed your family. You've got to clothe your family. You've got to get tools and equipment and things of that sort. And at the end of the year, if you take a look at this chart, a farmer sold their goods for $2,000. They paid off their loans. They paid off all of their other expenditures, and they had $200 left over. You might think, that's not making you rich. $200 isn't that much money. But at the end of the day, this was a decent living for a farmer. This is what most farmers came to expect. But here's the problem. If you take a look at the handout, there became a movement in the 1870s to do something called contraction. Many people, specifically rich people who already had a lot of money, thought that there was too much money in the money supply, meaning they thought there was way too many dollars out there. And some of you are thinking like, that makes no sense. Don't you want more dollars in the money supply? Well, here's the thing. The more 
things in the money supply, the more money there is. But then that means the less special each individual dollar is. What I mean by that is some people were promoting this thing called contraction, meaning they wanted to contract everything except gold out of the money supply. And that would mean there would be less money in the money supply, yes, but it would also mean that the money out there would be more special. It would be more valuable. Imagine if we were in a classroom of our of all of our classes and most classes that I have are between 25 and 30 people. Imagine if I bring in 30 large Little Caesars pizzas and say, hey, lunch is on me today. Well, everyone's going to have plenty of pizza. That's more pizza than we would need as a class. What if the next day I'd say, hey, lunch is on me again, but I only brought in two large pizzas to feed a class of 30? That's kind of what we're talking about here. That would make it of uh, the demand for that pizza much higher because the supply was much lower. And what a lot of farmers got worried about is that in the 1870s, the government was contracting money out of the money supply, specifically taking silver out of the money supply, making it the money supply lower, meaning when you went to sell your goods at the end of the year, you would not be able to charge as much for your grain, as much for your wheat or whatever it might be. Now, some of you are thinking, well, that's okay, because if you have to charge less for your products, then everybody else has to charge less for their products. Good point, but here's where you're wrong. Let's go to this. Go to the next slide. Da -da -da. If you go to the next slide here, in the second simulation, the farmer had to sell his products now for $1,000 instead of $2,000. Do you see that up there? Here's the problem, folks. Everything else went down as well. The supplies for the farm went down. The food for the family went down. The clothing, the tools, the miscellaneous. Everything else went down for the farmer as well because, once again, contraction. The money supply went down, so all of those other industries have to charge less for their products as well. But what didn't go down? You're right. The loan didn't go down. The banks said, hey, just because the money supply didn't went down doesn't mean that we're going to forgive that loan. See, a lot of these farmers took out these farms to build a barn, to start their business, to buy a steel plow, to build a home or something on their land when they got out there. When they got to the Midwest in the 1860s, and now during the 1870s, there was this fight to contract money and to bring the money supply down. Well, that's all well and good, but the loan stayed the same. Unfortunately, our country, as we're dealing with this health crisis, is going through an economic crisis at the same time. And a lot of people right now are worried, like, what's going to happen with my job? Am I going to lose my job? Am I going to lose my savings and things of that sort? And the government right now is telling banks, hey, if people are coming to you because they're having a hard time paying their loans because of this crisis, you need to let them off the hook or you need to give them a couple of months or whatever it might be. But that's not usually the way that it works. Most of the time, if people go to a bank and say, hey, I'm having trouble paying my car loan. Can you give me a few months? That bank's going to say, N -n 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 -n, pay your loan or we're taking your car. And this became the unfortunate fight for the farmers. Not only were they dealing with all of the na natural things and the other kinds of stipulations and troubles, the railroad companies really hitting them hard by just giving, making uh, their lives miserable by charging these unfair regulation rates for railroad rates and things of that sort. They also were dealing with this economy. A lot of people, specifically the Republican Party, became the control traction gold standard party and the gold standard sounds great when you want a lower money supply and when you have money in the bank already the lower money supply is awesome but when you're struggling when you have a lot of loans to pay off you don't want a lower money supply you want a higher money supply Give me four more minutes and then we're done. So if you take a look at this, these PowerPoint slides here, we're going to fly through these, and these largely correspond with the handout that I made for you. So please make sure you're taking a look at the handout. 1873 is when everything changes. Before 1873, our country had a bimetallic standard, meaning the money that we had that was based on paperback money and coins and sometimes even metals was always backed up by gold and silver. But in 1873, our Congress puts us on the gold standard, which means contraction or deflation takes place. There's now less gold in, uh, less silver, no silver, excuse me, in the money supply. Sorry, my computer is almost dying and it's just distracting me.
I'll be better. This is terrible for farmers. Farmers begin saying, what are we going to do? So they start fighting back. They start forming collectives. They start forming groups. They become known as the Silverites. They join silver miners who are also not happy with this act. And they start to really put pressure on the government and say, you need to do better for us. The government responds with something called the Bland Allison Act, which basically was like putting a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. They put a little bit of silver back into the money supply, but it was like 10% of what the farmers and silver miners wanted. And they wanted a lot more. They wanted more inflation. They wanted a higher money supply. They wanted more and more and more silver. Around this same time, the government also began to hear from these groups called the Grange or the Patrons of Husbandry. These are local associations of farmers that would get together and say, you know what, we need to fight for our rights. We need better treatment. We need better conditions. So these Granges would start to form on the local levels. But once again, it was only going so far to help farmers because is the federal government going to listen to a bunch of townsfolk of, of groups of farmers saying, help us out, blah, blah, blah. Unfortunately, we can't have a nation without farmers, but farmers are often a forgotten sector in our economy because they're not as valued as highly as big businesses and industry, both at the time and unfortunately even today. So these granges were great to form associations, and a lot of times they would um, come together and help farmers buy seed in bulk or share a steel plow or have dances and other groups. In fact, there's actually Granges around today. Albertus has a Grange. Topton has a Grange, which is not far from you guys. So these Granges started to help. But once again, it wasn't enough. The, gun, the country wasn't listening to these farmers. So at the end of the day, the United States government got rocked a little bit in 1891 when the farmers said, well, if the Republicans aren't going to listen to us, and if the Democrats aren't going to listen to us, we're going to form our own political party, and we're going to come together as a nation of farmers and fight this thing. And in 1891, a party called the Populist Party was formed that stood for populism, the idea of doing something that is in the best interest of all Americans, specifically lower income Americans, poorer Americans, farmers, miners, labor workers, labor unions, things of that sort became the target of these populists. And here were their big stances, obviously pretty easy. They wanted a higher money supply. They wanted an unlimited minting of silver, and they also wanted something called the progressive income tax, which is something that we have today. The more money you make, the higher your tax rate would be, meaning the richer people would pay more in taxes and the poorer people would pay less. Most of these populists were poor. There you go. In 1892, the uh, populists actually ran a candidate named James B. Weaver for president. We're now on the back of this handout, BT Dubs. And they actually got a million votes in the election. A million people said, I'm not voting for Democrats. I'm not voting for Republicans. I'm voting for the Populist Party, kind of like uh, voting for a Gary Johnson or a Ralph Nader um, or somebody of that sort, somebody besides the Democrat or Republican in these last couple of elections. And that takes us to the election of 1896. Throughout the 1890s, the government still isn't necessarily listening to the people, and they're still kind of struggling as to what to do here. Hold on. Dog needs to go inside. So in 1896, this next election was coming up, and a lot of people were paying attention to what the populists were going to do because they definitely outperformed what a lot of people thought they were going to do in 1892. And in comes the Silver Knight. Silver, you get it. William Jennings Bryan. William Jennings Bryan was a 36-year-old Nebraskan senator. He was from the Midwest. He was from a poorer family, and he was a Democrat, but he also believed in the things that the populace stood for. And in the summer of 1896 at the Democratic National Convention, William Jennings Bryan gave something called the Cross of Gold speech and basically alluded to the fact that we as a country need to help farmers. We need to help poorer people. It is a biblical kind of foundation that we need to take up our crosses and help the little guy. And that led to this coalition in 1896 of Democrats and populists coming together to nominate Bryan to try to beat the big bad McKinley. McKinley represented as the Republican the gold standard, the contraction, lowering the money supply and not helping out those little guys. So it all came down to who would win this election in 1896. Would the Republicans take the dub or would the Democrats Democrats and populists coming together beat the Republicans. You want to know what happened? I want to know what happened. Brian lost huge. 
William McKinley, the Republican, beats the Democrat slash populist William Jennings Bryan. And unfortunately for the populace, it was really the beginning of the end for this party. And it really does show that the country is still listening to the big, bad industrialist. That's section four. Unfortunately for the populace, they didn't have a long run, but they did have a significant run, and we'll talk more about that later. There is now an online Google form that I would like you guys to answer based on our conversation in this handout. Thanks for listening. You're the best. Stay safe. Stay classy.